Hello, my name is James Young, and welcome to It's a New Day. Today, my guest is Isaac Collins. This is someone who grew up in this community and has become very renowned for the work that he's doing. Isaac Collins is a social worker for the Rochester City School District. And normally when you hear the term social worker, you think of this stereotypical person who looks at social problems from a distance because many times the social worker is not from the community that they're serving. But in this particular case, Mr. Collins brings a very unique perspective to the work that he does in this community. I'd like to now introduce Mr. Collins to our show. Thank you so much for coming. Not a problem. Thanks for having me. Please share with us about growing up in Rochester. Uh, growing up in Rochester has been a great experience for me. Um, I really love the city. It has a lot to offer um, young people, especially if those things are, are identified and spelled out for them. And that's part of my role as a social worker. Um, I've been born and raised here. The only time I left Rochester was to go to uh, college in Buffalo uh, for six years and then returning back to Rochester to serve my community in this capacity. Very good. Before we really get into your work, I'd like to ask you how closely related is the work that you're doing and the people that you're working with, how closely related is that to your own personal life? Identical almost. Okay. Yeah. And tell us a little bit about growing up in the, uh, in the community that you grew up in, as well the things that turned your life around and put you into the direction that you went into. Okay. Uh, as you stated before, I grew up in the city of Rochester in the Crescent area, and um, extremely difficult. Uh, very early on, I had to learn that the power of education. Um, that's pretty much what got me on the path that I'm on today. But before I found that power, I was searching and looking for an opportunity to become involved with my community. And all I seen available in my community was majority negative resources. Okay. There were a lot of drugs, there were a lot of crime, um, a lot of despair in my community, which sort of began to shape my thinking along the lines of doing something different. Okay. And so it was a mentor that I had when I was younger who helped show me the way almost and, and really taught me the value of education and I began to latch on to that power and excel in that way. Okay. Now, will you tell us the students that you work with or the group of people that you work with in the city school district? Sure. Currently, I work for the city school district with the program called Youth and Justice. And we work with young men and women, mainly men, young men for me, in the juvenile system. Um, they're either in, uh, incarcerated, um, chemical dependent, or either on probation. And so what I see a lot of times is these young people in a system that they don't know anything about, can't navigate the course, but is sort of stuck in that system looking for a way out and an opportunity to really live up to their potential. Uh, I, I, I'm assuming that you must see a lot of pain in these young people. Can you begin to express that? Sure. Uh, each time I meet with a young person, the first thing I do is, is look them straight in their eyes and I can see the hurt and the pain. I'm a firm believer that behavior is a sign of an unmet need. Mm. And so what I do is I try to find out what that need is. I go a little bit deeper than the surface than what a typical social worker would do from outside of the community. Me knowing some of the struggles and seeing what they're going through, I know that they have the resiliency if you dig a little deeper. So what I try to do is I dig for that unmet need and try to meet them at that need. And sometimes it draws back to early years in life when um, parents may have got a divorce, um, they may have uh, witnessed uh, some type of trauma in their life that sort of shifted their thinking and shifted their mental capacity, so to speak, to allow them now to think on a road that is not so good. Because you have hands-on experience in this matter, is this part of the reason why so many children are failing, it's not necessarily because they can't perform academically, right. but it's because of social problems and social pressures. But would you speak on that? Yes, absolutely. Working from an academic standpoint, I see a lot of minority students in special education. And they have this label, and it's not necessarily because of their academics, it's because of their behaviors. And then, as I stated earlier, behavior being a sign of an unmet need, no one taking the the time to really find out what that need is because once that need is met, the behavior would change and they'll be able to excel academically. 
But if their basic needs aren't being met as far as food and shelter and clothing and things of that nature, they feel that they have to go out and almost get it themselves. Especially coming from single parent homes where mom is doing everything that she can, the father is absent most times, incarcerated himself, so he's not able to really uh, provide for the family. So the young person takes it upon himself to go out in the community and make fast money, so to speak, and find themselves in a, a dead end situation. Looking at your bio, one of the things that you had mentioned in your bio is how you deal with chemically dependent youth and sometimes even their parents. Yes. I, that to me has got to be absolutely tragic. Would you share those experiences with our viewing audience? Yes, I see it every day. Um, it's probably one of the most hurtful things I see in this role as a social worker. Um, both the mother and the child are looking to escape reality and so they use chemicals to be able to escape reality because the truth of the matter is the rent is due, our g &E is still due, food needs to be put on the table, and they have multiple siblings at home. And poverty is just so extreme amongst our people and in our community that sometimes they feel like that's the only way that they can turn. But I believe it's my job along with others to help restore the hope that was lost at one point in time to where that parent is empowered to now go out and receive employment, a good paying job to be able to support her children and herself, and at the same time, look out for the mental health of herself and her children as well. And that was going to be my next question. How does that healing process begin? Is there even the possibility of even for families such as this to heal? Absolutely. Um, resiliency is, is, is a word that I preach on a consistent basis to my students. Um, and even to the parents when I go to their homes and I meet with them. And I let them know, I meet them where they are. I don't, I don't try to stand above them or, or make them feel belittled in any type of way. I will get down to their level and I'll support my families as much as possible. Um, so to answer your question, there, the healing process really takes place when they do a, a self-examination. And they meet reality and they see exactly where they are and they're willing to change. If they're willing to put forth effort I'm willing to assist them in whatever I need to to help them to be restored. Is the education system um, prepared to accept the findings that you have when it comes to academics? Are they prepared to accept the fact that this child may not be academically not inclined, but there is something in the behavior that is preventing the learning process. Is the school district or the education system, are they allowing you to perform what you need to do to help bring these kids up academically? I think that's, that's one of the unique pieces about the program for which I'm currently in. Um, it really gives me a lot of flexibility to be able to pretty much uh, introduce new ideas, be creative, try new interventions to be able to assist but as far as the holistic approach of the district, I think that there needs to be uh, a little bit more uh, minority representation. These young African-American and Latino men and women need to see other men and women in position of color to be able to make this happen because what they're seeing is not conducive to what they're going through at the, at the time. Okay. I, I know that this has got to be tremendously overwhelming I, I, I don't know how you're capable of dealing with this and especially day after day, but can you talk about some of the successes that, that you've experienced? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's many successes that I've experienced. Uh, I've been working with fragile youth, I like to call them, other than as opposed to at risk, um, because I believe when you hear the word fragile, you hear delicacy, you hear um, you know, to be gentle and to take care of as opposed to at risk is more danger and more be aware of the student. These students are not um, dangerous, so to speak. Regardless of what it says on paper, if you take time to listen to their heart as opposed to what comes out of their mouth, then you'll see that. Um, so it's my passion. And what you're hearing right now truly is my heart. And that's the reason why I show up to work each and every day, willing to work with these families and really encourage them and motivate them and empower them because I can know that they can do it. Okay. And on the other side of the coin, what are some of your saddest experiences that you've seen in this? Um, my saddest experiences 
will have to be when I see um, young men and women, mainly men, return back to the prison system after being released. Um, I've just encountered a situation where I was working with a young man who was released and two weeks later came back into the system. And that's have to be one of my saddest things when I show up to work and I see him back in a county jail suit. It, it's, it's troubling to me. When you do see recidivism like that, what is the approach? I mean, because I, I know in most circumstances, when you see this young person come back maybe again and again, there seems to be the tendency to just to give up. And how do you continue to, to be encouraged, to continue to encourage this person that, okay, you, you, you still have another chance at turning your life around? And how, how does that process work? You never lose, lose sight of hope. And that's what I continue to instill in them. Even though you've been down this road once or twice, and maybe even three times, still don't lose your hope because it's, the towel is not thrown in, the fight is not over. You have to continue to fight day and day, day and day again. Because these young people really need to see that they can make it regardless of what they may go through. And a lot of time is the cycle needs to be broken. And the only way the cycle will be broken is to teach mm -hmm. and for the young person to learn um, what's going on, truly for them to see what's going on so they can move forward. Because this is what you do on a daily, regular basis, what are these young people thinking? What is, what is their world like? I mean, it's, we as an adult, um, we see the world so differently. We see it of us telling them what to do, what yes. not to do. Um, there is a piece of data out there that states that by the time a young person is 17 years old, they've heard, no, you can't, 150,000 times versus, yes, you can, only 5,000 times. Mm. So we're looking at a ratio of 30 to 1. What are some of the things that these young people are feeling, their pain, I guess not being paid attention to? And because you interact with them, what are they saying to you? What they're telling me is, a lot of times I see that they feel there's no way out. Mm. They feel like this is their life and this is the hand that they were dealt and they're just playing their cards. Um, a lot of times they see that they feel abandoned. What I find is a lot of young men, their, their fathers too, are incarcerated or someone in their, in their family they were close to have been incarcerated. So they feel that they're fulfilling the family destination, so to speak, or, or goal in life is to be incarcerated. So we have to break those chains and, and really allow them to see that just because you know your, your father may be in, went, to, went to jail or your uncle or your grandfather doesn't necessarily mean that you have to. So really getting, breaking away from the generational curses and allowing them to see that they can do better and then they will if they were to push forward. And I, and I think too, one of the problems is that we forget that these are still children. Yes. And I think that that's something that we overlook. We're looking at them sometimes as monsters. Uh, sometimes we forget that they are children. You're saying that you deal with um, many of the youth that come and become incarcerated. Are these criminal charges that some of them are faced with? Or are they things, for instance, not going to school and somehow they're punished by being incarcerated? Or, or are some of these charges criminal charges? I think it's a, it's a mixture of both. Um, I've just met with a few students this past week who were telling me that um, they were violated, their probation was violated simply because they were truant uh, from school. And then I talk with other young, young men who tell me that they have felony charges. Um, so it's really a, a balance and a mixture of both. Right. I just find this to be such a tremendous pressure that these young people are on. Absolutely. Not feeling a way out. I know that we don't have enough time, okay? But, but what are some of the things, but what are the, some of the solutions that we can offer? What can we bring, how, how can we bring hope to some of these young people? What does this community need to do to work in association with you? How do we get young people who see nothing but hopelessness how do we get them to see some hope? 
Um, one of the things that we can do as a community is rise. Mm -hmm. Rise up and stand behind our youth and really support their endeavors and, and really just be there for them. A listening ear is a lot of times all they want, want to see. And I'm encouraging you know, all type of disciplines from faith-based communi uh, communities all the way to ex uh, corporate communities to be able to stand up and really take a young person under their wing and mentor them. And it doesn't have to be a, a long, drawn out mentoring process. Once a month even, you can take a young person out and just listen to what they have to say and be there for them because they need to know that when they get in the midst of, even before they get in trouble, that they can call and reach out to someone who will talk them down because a lot of times they don't, really don't want to do some of the things that they get caught up in. You know, a lot of times it's peer pressure. And if they have a trusted adult, someone that they can, they can rely on and depend on um, and, and call and talk to, a lot of times that stuff will not even happen. I, I notice many adults, when they see the behavior of these young people, immediately their first thought is just to give up on them. Why even bother? Right. What would you say to adults that have that frame of reference? That they were children once themselves. And I'm sure that they weren't perfect in any shape, form, or fashion. You know, me being the age that I am, younger, I was, could have been considered a trouble youth as well. You know, the, the, the people that I hung out with, my friends, we weren't, you know, the best of people growing up, but we made a way. Uh, there's that resiliency again. We still, we had, back when I were younger, we had mentors and we had the Big Brother, Big Sister program. We had the Boys and Girls Club and we had individuals who checked on us and held us accountable. I think that's the difference these days. The young people don't have anyone to hold them accountable. So I would tell adults to hold them accountable in a loving way. What is also a message that you should be able to tell adults, what do we need to know when dealing with young people? Because now naturally this is your profession and professionally you understand how to interact. But yes. what can we do as adults? How do we begin, and especially when these aren't our children? There was a time when there was that accountability that you're talking about. There was a time when in our community that if a parent saw a child acting up, that child's parent gave that other parent the authority yes. to reprimand that child. We've lost that. Yes. Is this something that we should be going back to or how do we bring those types of things back into the community to let each child know that there is someone that cares about them? Great question. I absolutely believe that we should go back to the way things were, where uh, trusted adults was given the permission to reprimand children who stepped out of line, so to speak. I think we should go back there, and the way that we go back there is building relationships. Um, there's a lot of times now, these days, you, you live on the street for 10 years and you don't know the neighbor beside you. You know, and, and people don't reach out to each other anymore, they don't go over and have conversations. They don't know what's going on in the house next door. But I think that that's important to know because it takes a village to raise a child. And the community is, is there to enforce some of those things. And I think that we're all a part of the same community in a sense where we need to be accountable to our children. We need to let them know that we care for them and that we love them. So I agree that we need to go back that way and it, be, and it starts with relationships. Well, before we go on to the next point, I remember we had a woman like that in our community when I was growing up. She was all of our mothers. That's right. I loved the woman so much. I mean, I literally moved into the house. I moved my <laughs> clothes upstairs <laughs> and I lived there part time. So, uh, and she was such an inspiration to not only me, but to several, several people yes. that was in the community. Getting back to the chemical dependency, yes. how pronounced is this now in the community? Oh man, I would say two out of every three youth oh, my. are using uh, some type of uh, illegal substance, whether it be uh, marijuana, alcohol, even cocaine uh, is what we're seeing as, a, as an escape and release. 
I mean, it, it begins as a recreational activity and then it becomes a dependence and, and an abuse. And I, I would assume seeing young people going down this particular path, once again, fr from a personal point of view, how, how does this impact you personally? It impacts me greatly because I have a six month old daughter, you know, who will be growing up soon and she'll be engaged in this community and this generation. And to be honest with you, I'm, I'm quite afraid of the way things are going if we don't help turn things around. You know, it's very important. So I'm personally invested in that way and then also from my profession standpoint. Okay. I had asked you this off camera. How do you stop from bringing this home? I mean, I, I, I'm listening to you and then I'm assuming many of the viewing audience that, is, that are listening right now. And how do you stop from bringing this home or do you bring it home? How do you deal with your job personally? Because I, I, I think it's hard to go out from nine to five and yes. say, okay, I'm in this world. And then come home at five o'clock, 5.30 and leave this on the doorstep because I'm listening to you and, and this is so personal. I mean, yes. you're dealing with an individual's life and then if you're not only dealing with this child, but you're perhaps dealing with the parents. So yes. these, are, these are real factors. This isn't something that you're reading in a book. This isn't just theory. Yes. I mean, you're dealing with human lives. And how does that impact you when you're not working? Um, greatly. The way that I handle it is uh, lots of vacations. <laughs> okay. Um, I try to go on vacation. Uh, at least once a year. Okay. Um, that, that helps me. But when I can't get away, my, I told you off camera, my wife is a social worker as well. And um, her and I, we have plenty of conversations. So to answer your question, I bring it home. Okay. And I thank God for a spouse who can relate and can help me process some of these things because sometimes it's so heavy on my heart that when I come home, all I do is look to um, allow that to be, to be explained and expressed to her. You know, the saying is every social worker needs a social worker. Okay. So I have mine right at home. <laughs> well, that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Does she do similar work? Yes. That you're doing? Yes. She, okay. she focuses with uh, young women mainly as I do young men. Okay. Um, how has this impact with young women? Because once again, I, I come from an era and maybe I'm totally a antiquated, but I come from an era when we look at women as being mothers. Yes. Th these are the vessels for the future. Yes. And in today's world, and in particular, black women are now going to prison in disproportionate numbers. Yes. There is <laughs> not another group going to prison as fast as young black women. Yes. How do we turn that around? and? And look at the impact. Now, we've seen what the impact when there are no men in the community. Yes. Because there are no fathers to help raise the children. Yes. But now, if we start incarcerating women at this particular rate, now there'll be no women, so that boils down that there'll be no children. Right. Um, young women, I think they need to learn their value, uh, be taught their value at a very early age. And a lot of times, their fathers are the ones that are supposed to teach them the value. But since the fathers are absent most of the time, they begin to find value in other places. Um, sometimes with men that can care less about them and treat them in any old kind of way, and they okay. begin to live a lifestyle that sort of reflects the way they were treated by these men. Okay. And so their hearts become hardened. And when your heart gets hardened, you tend to do things that's totally outside of character that you wouldn't have done okay. if you received that love and that nurturing and that, that, that reassurance from an early age. That's why it's so important for me to reassure my daughter at such an early age and let her know, you know who she is as a young lady and as a woman so that she doesn't have to look for any type of reassurance in the street. How do you deal with young men that perhaps have already impregnated a woman to become a father, and especially if they don't have a father to image yes. fatherhood, 
the first part of the question, what kind of counseling do you give these young fathers to be better fathers? Um, two things, accountability and responsibility. Mm. Those are the two things that I preach to uh, teenage fathers. Um, I'm a little disappointed because there's not enough resources in the community for teenage fathers. You know, how to change a diaper and how to prepare a bottle and, you know, how to soothe a crying baby and how to just be there and support their children. Um, so for me, my standpoint is re responsibility and accountability for these young men, teaching them that it's not, anybody can make a baby, but it takes a father to really raise that child. So that's the, the perspective and standpoint I take from when I'm working with uh, young teenage fathers. I mean, that's a very valid point. I, I was 36 when I had my first child. I, I didn't have a clue. Um, when she was college, I, I didn't know what was going on. I, I, I didn't know, unfortunately, babies don't come with manuals. Yes. So I would imagine this is really have to be impactful on a young teenager. Yes. Being a baby, if you will, himself. Yes, it is. What do you say to young men that haven't impregnated a woman as of yet to hopefully stop them from becoming fathers? Um, abstinence and not safe sex. Abstinence. Um, I know that's now, not how, being... How well, does, how well is that received? It's not, it's not received well at all. <laughs> it's not received well at all. But it becomes with relationship. Okay. When you hold that young person accountable and they respect you and they, and they know that you have their best interests at heart. They try to do everything in their power not to upset you or to disappoint you. So with that being said, I'm actually mentoring a few young men now um, on both sides of the fence who are teenage fathers and who are not teenage fathers. And I'm telling the ones who are fathers to be responsible and accountable, and I'm telling the, the ones who are not fathers to practice abstinence so that they don't have to go through some of the things that young teenage fathers could have to go through. I mean, I'm 30 years old and I have a six month old daughter and I'm married. I have a master's degree, my wife has a master's degree, and it's still difficult for us to raise our child financially. You hit a very valid point when you were explaining this, and that is, it's because these young men know that you care about them, and it's because they know you care about them, that they won't do anything to disappoint you. Yes. I, I think that that is such a valid point. Yes. Because many times we as an adult, or we've become so estranged from young people that we have stopped looking at that. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if we could get more young people to understand and know that we care about them, yes. I think that that would give them a greater sense of themselves. Absolutely. And knowing that if they did something that this is going to impact someone that loves them. Could you speak a little bit more on that? Absolutely. One thing I like to uh, really encourage adults to do is learn the cry for help. Mm. Um, learn when your child is, is seeking um, some assistance or learn when a community um, member is seeking assistance, a, a young person from the community. They don't just come up to you and say, you know, Mr. Young, can you help me out with this situation? They cry out in other ways. And I think that a lot of... Um, a See, when you say cry out in other ways, can, yes. can you explain some of those behaviors of acting out, the things that they would do that an adult would perhaps misinterpret saying, well, this is just a bad kid? Absolutely. Uh, some of the things that they may do is um, the chemical dependency. Mm, okay. um, the usage of, of chemicals is a cry out for help. Um, sometimes they um, disrupt, I mean, act up in school, um, become truant in that way, find out why they don't want to go to school. It's not just that the, the work is academically challenging, it could be that they're being bullied and no one's you know, doing anything about it. Okay. So some of, those, some of those subtle signs, when your child is just not opening up like he or she used to, or um, they're hanging around a different crowd of people and their language is different, um, their, their persona is different. Those are all warning signs and red flags that parents and community members need to be aware of. And in this environment, 
Unfortunately, we're dealing with parents now that are only 15, 14, yes. 17 years older than their children. Yes. And so now if we have a child at 17, that means that the parent is perhaps maybe 34. Right. How do you deal with that dynamics? Because these are relatively very young parents that have children at that particular age. Yes. When that happens, it's, it's another one of those sad moments for the most, most part. Because a lot of times what I see is that parent really trying to live their life through their child. Mm. And they're being more of a friend than a parent a lot of times. And that's when I was saying that sometimes the parent is chemically dependent as well as the, uh, the young person because they're doing it together sometimes. And that's their way of bonding. That's their way of keeping their child near and close, so to speak. So it's more of a friendship than it is a parent um, relationship. And to deal with that is really trying to get the, the mother or the father some parenting classes, really establishing the authority, who's the authority in the home, and allowing the child to see that you can depend on your parent as a parent. Not to say that you can't be friends with your children, because I believe that relationship is important as well. But at the same time, a child needs to understand that you are the parent and you're the authority figure and that you are setting the rules and guidelines in the home. You know, I, I'm hearing more and more about how parents or younger parents have lost the skills or don't know the skills of parenting. Yes. And now they've taken on this concept of being friends with their children. Yes. I can remember raising my kids and one of the things I always let my children know, listen, I'm your parent. I don't give you like me or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is the way this is going down. But I also know that approach can be damaging as well. What are some of the middle of the road kinds of things? Once again, from a social worker point of view, not necessarily from a parent, but maybe in certain cases, maybe parents should be looking at this from stepping outside of their role as a parent and maybe looking at it from your eyes as a social worker. Yes. So some of the things that you can give parents, and, and especially some of the younger parents. Now, I do not mean to say that all young parents are falling under this particular pattern. Yes. Because I do, and I have met some very young parents that are keeping their kids on the straight and narrow that are making sure that their children go to school, Absolutely. making sure that their kids are getting the best of what they're possibly able to provide for them. So I want to make that very clear that we're not saying across the board yes. that just because you're a young parent makes you irresponsible. Absolutely. But there is a large percentage of these young people that are in tremendous pain and I believe a lot of that pain is coming from, it's because of this young parent not truly understanding. I, I've heard that there are young parents that go to nightclubs with their children. Yes. I mean, that is so hard for me to yeah. grasp because I, I just can't believe it. I, I can't imagine my mother and I going to a club <laughs> together. That just does not register in my head. Right. But then again, we're living in a different time. I mean, the world has, at one time, a generation was a hundred years. Yeah. Now, a generation is basically down to 15 years. Right. How is this impacting the social sciences? How is this impacting what it is that you've learned? I, I'm almost assuming perhaps maybe some of the things that you learned when you were going to school have become antiquated, they're outdated yes. because of the pressures and the social dynamics that are impacting now. And, and I do know, not to say any drugs lesser than this, but I do know that this crack epidemic yes. has totally, totally devastated this community. Absolutely. In ways that we are still yet discovering. And how do we begin to unravel this? How do we begin to make a better way? I know that you said better parenting you know, classes, and I know that the city of Rochester is doing things like that. I have an upcoming show 
that I'm going to be bringing from the city of Rochester that is talking about how to become a better parent and how to interact you know, better with your children. But once again, from your perspective, okay, how do you see these things? Um, it's definitely impacting the, the social um, justice you know, that's going on in, in, the, in the world today. But I believe that the remedy is, is quite simple. And I say that because a lot of people don't do it. And it's talk to your children. Okay. It's sit down at the dinner table, remove the, the electronics, remove the cell phones, remove the iPods, remove the laptops, and have dialogue with your children. Eat together at least three times a week. And this isn't you know, a, a fast, quick equation or a recipe to fix some of the epidemics that's going on in the world, but I believe it starts there. I believe that parents are children's first teachers. Don't rely on the educational system, the faith-based communities to raise your children. Have dialogue with them. Allow them to see that they can come to you and speak to you about anything and everything. And be able to let them know that there's a fine line there between friendship and parenthood. And you do that through conversation and relationships. That's a very valid point because once again, I hate to sound so ancient, but when we were growing up in the 50s and the 60s, we didn't have all of the dynamics that young people are faced with today. Yes. At that time, television was becoming a very new medium. They didn't know what to put on it, so many of us didn't watch it anyway. Yeah. And as a result of that, it gave us the opportunity to talk as, you know, to one another in the family structure. There were no fast food restaurants. And I can remember growing up, you had to be home at 6 o'clock yes. to eat at that meal because if you weren't there having that family meal at <laughs> 6 o'clock, that was it. You didn't come back to the table <laughs> till the morning. And those were some of the things that became the glue yes. that kept us together. And now young people are being impacted by so much. We are in a totally different world. Yes. We have the internet. We have the smartphones. We have satellite radio. Now television gets hundreds of channels. And if we are leaving these young people to their own, yes. and they're being bombarded with these messages this interaction. I think that this is also turning them becoming introverted inside themselves. I, I think we've now moved into the me generation. Yes. But when I was growing up, because of the social dynamics, fighting racism, segregation, we as a community were impacted. So we moved together as one voice. Now young people are moving individually, and I believe that a lot of this has to do with the dynamics that these young people are faced with. I think that your suggestion, turning off those iPods and yes. iPads and you know, turning off the television and sitting down is a great way to getting back to the family structure. Now, does that really work in this day and time? I mean, it's a great idea, mm -hmm. okay, but are young people prepared to do that? Also, another side of this question, because of these dynamics, this technology, this has not only impacted people in poverty, but this has also impacted people coming from other economic stratas because now, instead of the parent giving this child love, they're just throwing things at them. Yes. And now these instruments, if you will, become babysitters. Right. So talk about that as well from a social worker point of view. Absolutely. Uh, to answer the first part of your question, I, I think that it's a start. Okay. Um, do I think many youth will buy in? Uh, yeah, I believe that they will if the parent enforces it. That goes back to the, the, the fine line between parenthood and friendship. Okay. You know, if mom or dad turns the TV off and, and takes the cell phone away and say, listen, we're going to have dinner tonight as a family and we're going to discuss your day at school right. and we're going to discuss, you know, how things went at work for me and go that route, 
the kid will become, I think that they'll rejoice at the fact that they're having that face time. A lot of times young people make mistakes or do things in the community negatively is because they're looking for attention. And negative attention is better than no attention. So they're not receiving the positive attention that they're looking for at home. So they'll go out and do what they have to do to receive it from the authorities. And so if you show them positive attention, I think the negative attention will decrease drastically throughout our community. Um, so from a, a social work standpoint, and it goes back to the younger, the younger parents as well, not really knowing how to parent or how to love, so to speak, because they may have not been shown okay. that way. They do fill that love or that void with gimmicks. And they see that the batteries die, the cords, get rugged to where they don't work no more you know things break but if you but if you show them unconditional love you'll see that that's permanent and that's going nowhere and it outlasts every new creation or invention that anybody comes up with these days as far as technology is concerned love is the is, is really the, the means and the answer to a lot of the problems that we see today okay I, I know another big dynamic is that we spend a lot of time on the kids that act out. Yes. And we spend very little time on the young people that are succeeding. That has got to have a tremendous impact on the young people that are trying to do the right thing. Yes. And perhaps influences them to saying, why should I be good when the kids that are bad are getting all the recognition? Absolutely and I'm assuming that, that you see a lot of that and perhaps maybe these young people are even saying that to you. Now, I'm assuming that many of the people that you work with do have problems, but do you work with children as well that are doing well and more from a mentor point of view? Mm -hmm. And is this a problem that, that you're seeing with some of the young people that are good? Absolutely. Um, I think that, that that whole thing is backwards as far as individuals spending less time with those who are positive and more time with the negative ones. I think it needs to be reversed because those, a lot of times the reason why it gets lost is because a lot of people feel as if those who are doing well are self-starters and they're on their way so they don't need any assistance, which they couldn't be more wrong. Those are the ones you need to esteem more, you need to continue to support and push, be their backing so that they continue to excel because if not they become stagnant and they become, you know, pretty resistant to the fact that what is success getting me? You know, no one's noticing, no one's recognizing. So like you said, I might as well be like my peer who's getting in a lot of trouble. At least I know that he's getting the attention. Not to say that you totally turn your head away from those who are doing wrong because that the hope needs to be restored in them as well. But at the same time, I think more energy needs to be placed on those who are excelling because those are really the ones who are going to help shape and come back for those who um, are not necessarily doing as well. Okay, I want to go back to the education system for a second here. How do young people view education? Historically, education was equated with freedom. Yes. In the early part of this interview, you used education as a means of freeing yourself up from an environment that you didn't feel that was conducive to give you a bright future. Yes. How are young people looking at education? From my eyes, it appears that young people don't see education as a gateway to success. Exactly. They have a different viewpoint because you work closely with them. Yes. What, what is your interpretation of this? Um, that's a very good question. Um, because to be honest with you, what I see these days is um, education not being valued at all. Oh, um, it's not worth it, is what I hear from a lot of young people. Um, Before, how do they get to this state? But what makes them get to a point of where, because there are other segments of this community that still hold education as the gateway to success. Yes. How can we have a group of people so despondent where they're saying that that doesn't apply to me, that that can never happen to me, I'm always going to be in this hole? Because we live in a microwavable society. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these young people, they see, they want 
what they want when they want it right okay. now. Yeah. And since education is a, a long-term investment, they don't see the reason for it. I ask young people all the time if they know the degree ranking order, and they tell me no. They don't know that it's an associate's and a bachelor's and a master's and a doctorate. They can't tell you that because they don't see themselves in it. So going back to what I said earlier, it's our job to instill in them the hope and empower them that they can achieve. And there are many organizations, community organizations, that value education where you can get extra help, tutoring, um, that can assist you in these, in these efforts. But young people don't see the, or can't make the connection of long-term versus short-term. You know, they want money in their pockets right now. They want these gadgets, latest gadgets right now. They want the latest sneakers right now, the latest clothes. But they don't see that you have to work. I just told a young person the other day, this quote, I said, if you can remember this, you'll be successful. The more you learn, the more you earn. And he said, you know, what does that mean? And so I broke it down for him. I said, you know, pretty much the further you go in school, most likely the more money you'll earn, the, the greater sa your salary will be to where you can be a homeowner and really achieve that American dream that everyone speaks so highly of. I, I just find it an, an amazing set of circumstances that we can be this far removed from the, the very necessities that will help neg negotiate you yes. through the problems that you're faced with, to, the, to taking care of a family. And I guess I come back to, it has to come back to the family structure. Yes. And I'm assuming that perhaps maybe the reason why education is no longer a main thrust is because the parents yes. may not be educated as well. Yes. And therefore, we've lost that, which now brings me back to somehow we've got to get community members to understand that maybe this child is not our child, but yet it is our child. Yes. And we've got to do something because I think through your eyes, you are seeing the destruction yes. of us not paying attention. I use this quote quite often. Um, I paraphrase what Dr. King stated. The only thing worse than the horrible noise of bad people is the appalling silence of good people. Mm. So I believe that when we see these young people acting out and we're saying that's not my child or it's not my grandchild, so we don't care, yes. I believe we become part of the problem. We are just as responsible for the failure of this child. Absolutely. And I know that we've got to be able to do some things to turn that set of dynamics around as well. You're helping us understand some of the dynamics of why young people are failing academically in school. What does that do to a school system? I mean, it puts them at a peril. Last year, as you may well know, uh, only 46.1% of students graduated. Yes. And now one would believe that a lot of this is the fault of the school system. The school system isn't teaching. And I believe one of the things that has happened is that we've come to rely on the education system to educate our children. Yes. I had a guest on one time, a much older gentleman, and he said that at one time it was the parent who did the educating and when you sent your school, your sent your child to school, that's where they got their schooling. So <laughs> there's a big yes. difference. Yes. Somehow we gotta bring back the parent into this process. Yes. Somehow we've got to bring back this parent or this sense of community back into this process because that appears to me the only way to be out of this hole. The other part that I'm seeing that we're now having grandmothers and great-grandmothers raising these young people. Yes. Whereas 
that's another whole set of dynamics and situations. In, in your work, do you see a lot of that? Or I do. Or more of that than at one time we had? I do. I do. I would say, to put a percentage on it, maybe 35% oh of the young people that I come into contact with live with a grandmother or a grandfather. Because there's such a generational gap there, and, and I guess, too, there has to be such a void in this young person's life because they're not dealing with the mother. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with the love of a grandparent Absolutely. either. Sometimes, I mean, uh, uh, having a great, I mean, great grandparents are cozy. Right. You know, okay. <laughs> but to not have your parent there and to live with your grandmother on a consistent basis I would imagine there's got to be some trauma with that as well. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And is this another part of why young people are acting out as well? Perhaps this is something else that they're trying to say? Yeah, because you know when you're living with your grandparents, a lot of times they're totally removed from the current generation. Oh, yeah. They grew up in a, in a time where things were totally different. So they can't really relate to their grandson or granddaughter. I mean, they're cozy, they're, they're great to be around, they love you unconditionally, uh, they probably cook the best, the best dishes. <laughs> but when it comes to really sitting that young person down and talking to them about what's really going on in the community and their behaviors and stuff like that, they don't really have much to, to, to really say regarding that because they're not out in it. And then the, the question poses in the young person's mind, you know, why doesn't mommy or daddy want me you know, they feel abandoned again, and they feel left um, to fend for themselves, so to speak. So that's, that's really a, a big question that comes up is, well, if my mother or father love me like they said they do, how come I don't re re live with them? How come they don't care enough to have me underneath the same roof? And the kid doesn't see that the parent may be struggling, may can't afford housing, um, may looking, uh, is looking to um, where their next meal is going to come from. They may not know. But they can't see that. All they see is that they're away from their parent and they're living with their grandparent. And so it raises the question that my mom or my dad does not care enough to have me live home. Now, I, I know that we've covered a lot of ground in almost an hour. And I, I know that there perhaps maybe many of the viewing audience are thinking that this is just such a dilemma. Let me just turn the lights off and go to bed. Right. But we can't have that attitude we have got to be diligent. Yes. We have got to figure this thing out. In closing, what are some of the things that, that we can do? I know we talked about some of this, but now trying to tie all of this up. And, and I want to tie this in also w with your expertise as a social worker. Okay. I mean, if you can give us a list of things that we can do, and more than anything, give us some encouragement to let yes. us know that this isn't we haven't reached a bottomless pit that we can turn this thing around. Absolutely. Some of the things that we can do as a community is to reach out to our local uh, non-for-profits that may be uh, in our area um, or for-profits, somewhere we can met, uh, mentor some young people, whether it's taking a day out of your busy schedule, going to a public school and, and helping out in some way, shape, form or fashion these young people and trying to show, and letting them know that you are there for them, you're ready to listen to what they have to say. And as I stated earlier in the interview, that a behavior is a sign of an unmet need. Really look for that need that needs to be met and try to meet it so that you can see the behavior diminish. Those are some of the things that we can do um, as a community. And from a social worker standpoint, I just want to encourage everyone to let them know that we have not hit the bottom. Okay. There's still hope in our youth. <laughs> They still inspire to be great, and they will be great with the help of us and others. And I believe with you on our side, because I believe it's going to take great people to make us great. And I thank you so much for coming on no the show. No problem. Because, and, I, and I speak to you not only as a parent, but as a member of this community, and I want you to know that I truly appreciate that the work that you're doing 
and I wish we had another hour. It yeah. went by so quickly, but I would love to have you come back on the show. We'd love to. And talk some more to us on how we can turn this whole situation around. Thank you so much for being on the show. You're more than welcome. Okay. The prime purpose in life is to help each other. And if we can't help each other, at least not to hurt each other. No one is worth meeting if that person doesn't have something to teach us, something that we would never learn from a book or something that we could never learn on our own. So always remember, every morning that you wake, it's a new day. Be blessed, and I will see you next week.